Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York. It is the summer of 2021. We're glad that you could join us here at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Today, it's our virtual author series. Uh, we'll be talking to a friend of ours, uh, Mark Healy, who has written the book, Gotham Baseball, New York's all-time team. There's a look at the cover of the book, and we'll uh, go in depth on Gotham Baseball in a couple of moments. Before we officially introduce Mark to the program, we do want to remind everybody that this and all of our other virtual programs are made possible by the generosity of the Ford Motor Company. We thank them for being our sponsor uh, throughout 2021. Again, joining us today for the virtual author series, uh, Mark Healy, who has written the book, Gotham Baseball. Uh, Mark has uh, worked in the newspaper business for many years, produced a magazine, and it was a magazine uh, about Gotham baseball that eventually led to the publishing of the book, Gotham Baseball, in 2020. We welcome Mark to the program. Mark, how have you been? Uh, Bruce, I'm great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, you know, this opportunity to talk uh, you know, to the Baseball Hall of Fame and to you, uh, everyone that's watching. Uh, about the book. We want to let people know uh, some ways they can purchase the book. Mark does have a website. Uh, it's www.gothambaseball.com. And then if you do backslash purchase, that will give you more information on getting the book. Uh, you can also go to the Arcadia Publishing website as well, arcadiapublishing.com. So there's just a couple of ways that you can acquire the book. Mark, I do want to talk a little bit about what led up to the book, Gotham Baseball. It really did start with this magazine, which came out in the early 2000s. This is one of the issues. Yeah. Beautiful artwork here, Mickey Mantle, number seven. Uh, you can see stories about Tom Seaver, Andy Pettit, uh, Leo DeRocher, who, by the way, was actually born on this day, way back in 1905. But Mark, if you will, tell us about Gotham Baseball, the magazine, what that all, what that was about. Well, I had been working at Associated Press um, starting in 1998. And, you know, I, I, I really loved it. I loved writing about baseball there. I loved being a part of the number one, what I, what I called the number one news agency in the world. But I really wanted to cover baseball. You know, that's what I really wanted to do. And, you know, people work at the Associated Press for many years, you know, so there was quite the uh, quite the, the totem pole. And I was on the very bottom of it. So uh, around 2001, when it became clear that the Brooklyn Cyclones were going to have a team, um, long story short, I wound up getting myself covering that team. So I was you know, working at the AP for eight hours a day and then covering the Cyclones for another six or seven hours. I didn't get a lot of sleep, but I learned what a baseball beat was really like. Hmm. And during the course of that process, I really wanted, because covering the Cyclones, you got to interview the Carl Erskins, the Duke Snyders, all these great uh, players from yesteryear. And it really got me thinking, there really should be a place where fans of all ages can come and not just read about the Mets and the Yankees, but what came before as a history buff, you know, I always want to know what's the real story. What's the backstory. And I think that, you know, being that New York, you know, I know that there's people watching saying that's not the case, but I think that New York is the center of the baseball universe. So I wanted to create a place. Uh, I wanted to create a, a magazine because uh, there wasn't anything like that. You know, so Gotham Baseball was started in 2005. Uh, it, its goal was to cover the past, present, and future of the New York game, as we called it. Uh, this, this particular cover that you're looking at is um, the Mickey Mantle cover. That was our seventh issue. Uh, the artwork is by John Panisi, who did all the artwork in my, my Gotham Baseball book. But that was really um, the genesis. You know, I wanted to create something where people could read about college baseball, could read about, you know, the history of baseball and also read about what was going on with a different twist uh, in, in, in the current game. Interesting. You had some contact with the Hall of Fame about this magazine. I believe yeah. we might have been a sponsor 
at one point in time. And then you communicated yes. with our library to make sure that we had copies of all the issues. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Um, you know, we had started to in fact, it was the issue after this, our eighth issue uh, with Johan Santana was, was the, on the cover, which was the first online version of the uh, magazine that we did. And right around that time, we had decided that we couldn't really afford, you know, independent magazine publishing is rough. And in 2008, it was really rough. And we figured that with our web presence, which was so big at the time, we went to an online product. And it was around that time that I got a letter in the mail from Jim Gates, who just retired, uh, the librarian at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And he had said, uh, you know, wrote me this beautiful letter about how someone had passed along the magazine uh, to, to the folks and they wanted to make it part of the National Archives. So needless to say, uh, with the Baseball Hall of Fame being one of our first major advertisers back in the day, uh, now uh, with this event today, it's really been a quite a uh, quite a, a cyclical thing with the Baseball Hall of Fame. So that was, when, when Mr. Gates sent me that letter, uh, you know, that was pretty amazing. Mark, what motivated you specifically to want to create a book, which is essentially centered on some of the greatest players all time in the history of New York City baseball? Uh, what motivated that decision? Because as anybody who's written a book can tell you, it can be a major undertaking. There's lots of obstacles. What, um, what kind of gave you the, um, the hunger to do this? Well, you know, I had toyed, you know, being a journalist for 25 years, I toyed with the idea of doing a book. And I, I, I never really knew what it was going to be. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, I realized, you know, I'm going to turn 50 soon. And maybe I should, you know, maybe I should write a book finally. Maybe I should, I should do something. And, you know, Gotham baseball had really always been my passion project. It really had always been something I poured my heart and soul into. And, you know, after talking with a couple of people, my friend Matt Cerrone uh, was one who gave me the idea of maybe doing a book. Uh, we had worked on some other projects where we had done a poll. I had sent out a poll for uh, another idea. It wasn't even supposed to be a book. It was supposed to be just uh, a product that we were going to do with Stratomatic. Uh, we're basically creating an all-time team. And we sent out a ballot. And in addition to sending it to fans, I also sent it to people in the, in the industry, you know, uh, baseball executives I had met over the years, scouts, uh, former players, uh, all took part in the poll. It was a lot of fun. You know, it was a lot of arguments. People were like, how could you pick that guy? How could you vote for that guy? And really what it lent itself was, without me even knowing, that was the foundation of the book. So when it came time in 2017 to start working on it, um, you know, I, I, I just felt that I'm going to turn 50. I'm 53 now. So that just tells you how long it took me to do the book. But I wanted something. I wanted Gotham Baseball to be more permanent than just a magazine, than just a website. I, I felt like if I had if I did a book because we were always critically acclaimed, you know, Gotham as a product was never we never really made any money. Uh, we lost some money. We never really made any money. And not that this was about making money. It just was the critical acclaim was great, but I wanted something tangible. I wanted something that was a little bit more uh, permanent, as I said, uh, for, for fans to grab onto. And in the process, maybe educate folks a little bit about where I was from and who I was and, and what Gotham baseball was all about. And that's how it all that's how it all came together. You know, Todd Radham, the artist uh, who did the book cover, who, who's always been a friend, said he wanted to work on me on my next project. And, and so, you know, having somebody like Todd involved, having somebody like Marty Appel, who did the foreword, who's always been a friend and a mentor for many years. Uh, it all kind of came together. It took a while, but it all kind of came, came together over the course of a couple of years. So that was really the motivation was, was to have something um, you know, more permanent that I could look back on with my kids, with my grandkids, um, and hopefully some other folks along the way, that Gotham baseball, what it was and what it's all about. So in putting together this all Gotham team, if you will, 
you nominated players at each position, also a manager and a general manager. Uh, but then you kind of left it up to voting of fans and historians and experts. Yes. And as part of that, you decided, let's create a distinctive uniform for this imaginary team. And I guess it was Todd Radom who helped you with this as well, correct? Yeah, it was Todd. Todd, you know, as I said, you know, I've gotten to know Todd through uh, my friends Dan Tuig and Keith Blacknick, who run the Queens Baseball Convention every year. And it was a fan fest for Mets fans. And, you know, I had gotten to know Todd through that. And so he was always, you know, he always used to say what a fan he was of the magazine. And we would talk and we, we shared a passion. And so, you know, as I said, he had said to me, the next time you work on something, I'd love to work on it with you. And, you know, I was like, uh, what could I possibly come up with that the great Todd Radom would want to work on me, work, work with me on something? So, uh, you know, and then I, I, as I was trying to figure out this unifying thing for the book, I don't know why I was paralyzed by it. It's like, well, how am I going to bring all this together so that there's, you know, some kind of central theme to it? And Todd shares a, a love for uniforms, as I do. I love tinkering. So I said, Todd, you know, you always said you wanted to work on something with me. Um, how do you feel about like working on designing a uniform for the Gotham baseball team? And he was like, absolutely, what should we do? So I had sent him some childish sketches, which we are not showing in this, in this uh, PowerPoint, but uh, I had sent him some ideas of what I was thinking. Um, I also had sent him some of the thematic ideas that I had had. And these are the beautiful uniforms that he put together. This is the 1950s version. Todd didn't just create one uniform numbers. He created three and a home and road version of each. So, um, you know, that's one of the things I had to include in the book uh, was that process because it was so important to my writing process to have that unifying theme that brings all these eras of players together. Mark, I'm curious about the word Gotham and where that comes from. I first became familiar with this going back to the 1960s TV show, Batman. They always right. reference Gotham City. Does it come from that or was, is there something earlier? Where does that word Gotham originate? Well, look, I'm not going to lie and say that it probably like the idea of Batman and Gotham didn't play some kind of role, but Honestly, the name Gotham just came, I was just thinking about, uh, I was working on a bunch of different projects. This is like 2003, 2004. Mm. And I was thinking about a, a bunch of different projects. And one of those projects was, you know, creating a site, as I said before, about the past, present, and future of New York baseball. Mm. And I didn't want to call it Big Apple Baseball. I didn't want to call it New York City Baseball. I wanted to think of a name that was evocative. And so Gotham popped in my head because a lot of people have referred to uh, New York City as Gotham, uh, maybe, maybe in reference to Batman, maybe not. But then I also thought of the, the, the reason why, and I looked it up because I wanted to have a reason other than Batman to tell people that that's why it was called Gotham Baseball. But, you know, there's a tale about Gotham um, in England, and that the the uh, villagers in Gotham uh, were it was the marauding. I, I I don't know if it was the Turks or whoever. Somebody was about to take over the town of Gotham, mm. and they made believe that, that they were all lunatics. So you know they were so much smarter than everybody else because they did that. Their town did not get sacked and burned to the ground, and that's where kind of the whole idea of you know Gotham. Uh, you know, comes from as far as literature is concerned. So I kind of like that. I kind of like that. You know, I always think that New York baseball fans are smarter than everybody else. And so that kind of played a role in it too. It's been ages since I've been in New York City. Do people within the city still refer to New York occasionally as Gotham? Is that nickname? I think so. Still I prevalent? think if you, I think if you read, I think if you read, more so if you read rather than verbalize it. Uh, you know, 
I, I think people still refer to it as Gotham sometimes. I, I think you see it sometimes in newspapers when they're trying to say something clever uh, and that's okay, you know? Yeah. I look at the word and I, the way my mind works is very strange. Of course, I see two words, got ham, right. the way that they're separated, but it is indeed right. Gotham. Mm -hmm. So that's in a sense, the city name. Is there a nickname that goes along with it, like a Mets or Yankees, or is it just Gotham? No, it's just Gotham. I mean, you know, I wanted to incorporate uh, all of the teams. And if you look at some of the, um, the logos and stuff that we've done, um, it really is the Navy's for the Yankees, the orange is from the New York Giants. Uh, the, the script on the home uniform, the current version, comes from the Dodgers. Uh, you know, the G, our, our G on the caps, comes from, it's, it's, a, it's a homage to the New York Giants. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to incorporate uh, all the different teams into the colors and the theme of Gotham baseball. I'm a big Met fan. But I love the, the Yankees history. I love the, the, the fact that you can go back and, and you know, uh, Don Amore wrote a great book uh, called, um, I can't think of it, uh, a Franchise on the Rise. Thank you, Don, for making me all about the early days of the Yankees, that if people read that today, they'd have no idea that the Yankees struggled so much before they were turned into a, a winning franchise. So yeah. to me... My dad was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I, I heard stories about the Brooklyn Dodgers when I was a little kid. Uh, did a lot of research on my own just by reading. I, I love baseball books. And you, if you read this book, Gotham Baseball, I, I mention about 30, 35 books because I love baseball. And I love baseball books. And I, I, I still read them. Uh, I'm reading Brian Hoax right now, the, 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 the Brock Zoom. So um, it, it really is Bruce we wanted to incorporate all the teams because, you know, I'm a Met fan, but I, I love baseball and I especially love New York baseball. Well, that's certainly evident in both the magazine and the book. Now you start off the book by referencing a real favorite of mine. This is somebody that I got to know in my early years here at the hall of fame, great writer, highly intelligent man, the late Leonard Coppett. Explain why you reference Coppet right off the bat, page one of the book. Well, that was, I mean, that was Marty. Marty Appel did the foreword and he wanted, you know, when I read it, I, I always tell people I'm so glad that Marty, uh, you know, uh, gave me the opportunity to, uh, that, that he said yes to writing the foreword because I knew it would be great. And somebody just this morning, said to me, oh, any, any book with a foreword by Marty Appel has got to be good. And I'm like, look, I said it in the acknowledgments, you know, um, it might be the best thing in the book, the best written thing in the book, and that's okay because it's Marty Appel. But, uh, you know, he references Coppet uh, in saying that, you know, that he walks into a room and he said, all everything that you're talking about is wrong, <laughs> you know, and that's how Marty kind of started out his foreword. And, uh, you know, Look, for me, having, you know, having, uh, and, and of course, you know, Leonard Coppert's books are amazing and I've read them all. Um, Marty, Marty uh, has been a mentor. He's been a friend, but he's always been someone I could talk to and someone that I could trust. And that's not an easy thing to say in this business. And so that first chapter, that foreword um, is amazing. And uh, I love it. I, I, I really uh, appreciate you bringing it up because uh, it, it meant a lot to me. And it still does. Marty obviously knew, knew Leonard very well. Did you ever have a chance to meet Leonard? I did not. I'm sorry. I did not yeah. have a chance. Well, you, you certainly would have liked him. He was a, a very charming guy. Uh, he was um, willing to poke fun at himself. He didn't have a large ego, even though clearly he knew a lot, not just about baseball, but about other areas of life. Uh, he was kind of a wise old guy in many, many ways. We would see him sometimes when we went down to Florida for the Veterans Committee elections. Leonard was on the committee for a number of years. Uh, he would occasionally come up to Cooperstown as well. We once did a program right next door in our bullpen theater. And when you can combine somebody that has that great intelligence, but also the modesty as well, 
that's pretty rare. And Leonard certainly had that ability. So any mention of Leonard Coppett, that's going to be a, a good way to start the book off. I think yeah. uh, Marty did that very nicely. Let's talk a little bit about some of the players uh, that you highlight in the book. We're not going to do all the positions, uh, but we are going to highlight uh, some of the players, some of the more interesting selections. And I should caution folks that these are not Hall of Fame selections. We try to look at things very objectively, very neutrally with regard to the Hall of Fame. They're not even necessarily marked selections. You nominated a number of players in each category, but then essentially left it up to the fan and expert balloting. So we're going to begin with a real favorite here, Derek Jeter, who is officially going to be inducted in about six weeks from now, coming up on September the 8th. Um, in talking about Derek Jeter, a couple of things come to mind. I don't know that people fully appreciate what a great offensive player he was. Maybe it's because he didn't hit with you know, classic power like a Cal Ripken, but he was a tremendous hitter for average. He drew a lot of walks. He got on base. He was a supreme base runner. Offensively, I think he's actually an underrated player. Your thoughts on Derek Jeter? Well, obviously, you know, Jeter was my shortstop. I didn't really spend a lot of time, you know, uh, making the making a decision there. Um, look, Jeter to me, and I write a lot about it in the book. Um, it just seems that today a lot of folks, when they talk about Jeter, it's almost like with a smear, uh, talking about the fact that maybe he played shortstop uh, maybe a little bit longer uh, than he should have, that he didn't have great range, that he wasn't a great defensive player. Um, for me, Derek Jeter was the consummate professional. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better everyday player, a better leader, uh, a better example of what it is. And again, you know, people will say whatever they want to say about Derek Jeter. All I know about Derek Jeter is, is that he came to play every day. I can't remember a moment in Derek Jeter's career when a game was on the line that he didn't make the play that needed to be played, you know, that needed to be made in that spot. Uh, the time that Derek Jeter failed, you know, in a, in, a, in a big game that the Yankees needed to win. I don't remember it. And I covered his career, you know, pretty much from the time that he stepped onto the field at Yankee Stadium in 1996. 1996 was the first year I started covering baseball. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I got to see Derek Jeter as a rookie and then, you know, got to see him as he retired. And now, you know, at running a Marlins organization. So uh, for me, Jeter was, was just the consummate pro, the consummate Yankee. I mean, think about um, all the guys that have played for the Yankees over the years. Uh, Phil Rizzuto, who, who, you know, before Derek Jeter came around, was, was possibly, probably the greatest Yankee shortstop, certainly the only one to ever win an MVP. And, you know, for me, the circumstances – of his career, you know, his 3,000th hit being a home run. I mean, look, just doesn't get any better than that. And if I'm a Yankee fan, Derek G is probably my favorite player, but the stats back it up. I mean, you know, you can't even, no one's had the kind of career uh, playing that position, wearing that uniform um, for the New York Yankees. How could he not be the all-time shortstop? As a New York baseball historian, you look at Jeter, he had so many memorable moments in his career. Is there one that you'd put at the top of the list? Was it the flip against Oakland? Was it the home run where he became Mr. November? Was it that 3,000th hit that you referenced a moment ago? Was it something else? What's that moment for you? Well, I certainly don't like to bring up the home run he hit off uh, Bobby Jones in the 2000 World Series. I don't want to bring that up. Um, it was probably the flip. I think the flip is the thing that when you think about, you, you know, when you talk about Derek Jeter and his professionalism and his ability to just sense the moment, uh, that was a moment and it's been picked apart by so many people, but that's what you think of. I mean, the flip is just, you know, you're watching you're like, Oh my God, like what just happened? Yeah. And, you know, like as, as a player, you always wanted to be like when I played, I wanted to be known as the guy that knew what to do and didn't need a coach to tell him where to run or what to do. That was such an instinctive play that really, I think, 
I, I think it really defines Derek Jeter's career. I mean, he's had so many moments, uh, but I, I think the flip is definitely the one. Thanks for the, thanks for mentioning that. But I really think that's the one that defines Jeter's all around game. Yeah. His intelligence, his headiness. I agree with you about the flip. Uh, it's a great choice. Here's a great photo. It's in the book. Yeah. Maybe the best photo. Uh, I think it might've been your favorite. This yeah. is when Derek Jeter and David Wright, who was on the right side of the picture, uh, were teammates with Team USA. I'd never seen this photo before you sent it to me. Uh, what year was this? And do you remember the circumstances around this photograph? Well, that's a good question. I know it was for the WBC, so I'm going to be a little off on the date. I want to say it was 2015, 2016, but I'm not positive. Okay. Uh, I do know that it was my friend Bill Menzel that took the photo. Uh, he was covering the WBC for Gotham Baseball and for some other outlets. And he sent me that photo years ago. Um, and it was just, you know, I look, for two reasons. I think he knew how much I admired Derek Jeter's uh, ability and professionalism, but he also knew I had a big soft spot uh, for David Wright. And David Wright was, you know, working his way back from injury uh, during that time. I want to say it was 2015 or 2016. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm bad with dates. Math is my kryptonite. I think I say that a lot uh, on social media. Um, remembering dates, that's why I write everything down. But uh, it, it's my favorite photo because it captures the two of them. I think that, that David, in, in many ways, uh, was a lot like Derek. Uh, he did not have the cast around him for his career that Derek did, but David and, and you know, Captain, I, I think I captioned it in the book, Captain Clutch and Captain America. Um, you know, this is what you want in a ball player. You know, uh, these two guys, both captains, both uh, responsible for the leadership of their clubs and the number one major, you know, the number one media market in the world. And having those two guys in that moment when, when you know, Billy knew it. Billy has always taken great photos like this. He knew when he took that photo that that people were just going to like look at it and be like, wow, what a great photo. And uh, that's why I included it in the book. It was just it just seemed perfect since they're both on the, you know, the, the left side of the infield for the New York's all time team that it was it, it just you couldn't script it better than that than to have that picture. I think also because David Wright had so many back problems that interfered with his late career. Those last few years, he was trying to come back repeatedly and just really couldn't, couldn't come back to the same level that he was. It's easy to forget what a great player he was in his prime in those early years for the Mets. Um, it, it's strange to say that he's, he could be a forgotten player. I mean, I think Mets fans are not going to forget him, but maybe fans in other cities because Wright did struggle so much with injuries the last four or five years, people around the country may not remember just how good he was at his peak. You know, and that's, you know, a big reason why, you know, when they, when the, when the, when the Mets lost the 2015 world series, you know, David hit a home run uh, in that series. And I really feel if the Mets had figured out a way to win that series, that maybe people wouldn't forget that maybe it would have been, the kind of moment that Don Mattingly did not get uh, in his last year. And I think that there's a, there's definitely a, a comparison to be made between those two players, you know, two guys that really had they stayed healthy would both be in the hall of fame. There's no question uh, that David Wright was on a hall of fame track. And that's, that's those words. I don't want to take credit for those words because those were the words that Howie Rose, the great radio broadcaster for the New York Mets told me, when, when I interviewed him on the field uh, at City Field, when we were talking about uh, some of the, the people in the book, and I wanted Howie's pr perspective because he's a broadcaster that's also a historian. Oh. And I felt that he would give me, you know, I felt that he would give me the real, you know, the real, the straight dope, as it were, uh, on, on, on David. And, and that's, you know, for me, I think that, I, I think that David's, injuries um as you said the Mets fans will never forget them uh and you know it's it's sad that when injuries happen to a player that does not win a world series that we 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 forget that he won a gold glove we forget that he was the captain of the Mets we forget 
uh, of how good his numbers really were. And that's why uh, a big part of why he was named uh, New York's all-time third baseman. I imagine, Mark, you had a chance to talk to him a number of times. Yes. Yeah, he is. The way that you hear about him, uh, he is just a fantastic guy. Uh, I, I, I have nothing bad to say about David. And, you know, sometimes I think people try to say things even about the nicest guys in the world. Uh, David, um, I interviewed him when he first came up. I interviewed him over the years. Uh, we put him on the cover of uh, our third issue and named him 2006 Player of the Year. Uh, when I called David to interview him for the book uh, and I introduced myself because I don't, you know, it's not like we're best friends. I just said, Hey, David, this is Mark Healy from Gotham baseball. And he says, yeah, I remember I have, I, I, I have your magazine that you put me on the cover. It's in my office. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is going to be a great interview. But um, you know, David uh, over the years, just the consummate pro uh, he was someone that, uh, and I think the anniversary of his, uh, of his debut 17 years ago was just the other day. Uh, and we wrote about it. And, um, you know, just David was just one of those guys that you just, when you saw him, uh, and I wrote, when I wrote it in the chapter, I said, you know, I was the first time I heard the name David Wright, I was sitting uh, in the press box at, uh, at uh, Key Span Park, which is uh, the, then the home of the Cyclones. It's MCU Park now, or, I even forget that the corporate names change. Uh, but that was the first time I heard him say he was the, he was the, um, you know, the draft pick that they took with the, with the, when they lost Mike Hampton, uh, this shortstop, this kid at high school uh, was the pick for the Mets in the, in the, you know, uh, in the supplemental round, you know, so that name always stuck with me. Cause I was like, who's David Wright? Who is this guy? So I followed his career in the minors uh, because I used to write a lot about the minors for Mets Inside Pitch, the old magazine that covered the New York Mets. And, um, you know, it just seemed like a guy that was going to be successful. So I kept my eye on him. Uh, and then when he made his debut, you know, it was uh, pretty awesome after that. Uh, he's had a rock solid career, one of the real good guys in the game. And really a lot of parallels you can draw between Wright and, uh, and Jeter. Uh, yes. Guys never involved in controversy. Uh, they, uh, in some ways have been New York city baseball heartthrobs, um, as well as being great players on the field. One of the more interesting choices for the book is left field. Uh, here we have a drawing of the great Monty Irvin, a hall of famer in that imaginary Gotham uniform. Uh, we mentioned earlier that the book is not just about great players for the Mets and Yankees, but the old New York giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers are included. And so Monty Irvin is a big part of that, a player whose career was split between the Negro Leagues and the Major Leagues. And because of that split career, doesn't always get the credit he deserves. Well, you know, look, Monty Irvin earned the, earned the vote on the ballot. Like he, he was the guy that won the vote uh, for left field. And some people have criticized the fact that I didn't do outfield, 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 that I, I, I actually broke it down to left field, center field, right field. But, you know, if you're going to build a team, you don't pick three outfielders. You pick who's your best left fielder, who's your best center fielder, and who's your best right, best right fielder. That's how you put together a team. And that's how I wanted to put this team together. So um, I was hoping beyond hope that when I put Monty Irvin on the ballot, that people would vote for him, and they did. Uh, and I think that lends itself to the fact that it wasn't just open to, uh, you know, the fans of today, that, that the voting was open to people from all ages, people from all walks of life. And, you know, Monty Irvin, it solidified it for me when I, I interviewed Buck O'Neill in 2006, probably a couple of months before he passed. And he had the opportunity to sit down with Buck O'Neill. And, you know, we sat down in the Brooklyn Baseball Gallery. Uh, where the Cyclones play. And we were alone for about 25, 30 minutes. And we just talked about baseball. And it was really up until that moment, I had known about Monty Irvin. I had read about Monty Irvin. And until that conversation with Buck O'Neill, uh, he, he just felt, he goes, if you had seen Monty Irvin play 
24, 23 years old, you'd say that he was the best player you ever saw. Mm -hmm. That's how gifted he was. And as I go into the chapter of the book, he was supposed to be the first. You know, the Negro Leagues actually had voted him to be the player most likely to succeed in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to I don't want to give away too much, but if you really want to find out why Monty Irvin wasn't the first uh, player to break the break the color barrier, you got to read about it because it was just incredible to hear about not only decisions that other people made, but decisions that he made. You know, he had this inner ear problem that affected his ability when he was in the war. And when so Branch Rickey came calling to, to bring him to the major leagues, it was Monty Irvin that said, no, I, I, I can't give you my best, you know? And so to me, Monty Irvin's always been fascinating to me. Uh, you know, not only, and it's so great that baseballreference.com now has, uh, you know, all these great statistics. So people could go back and look at the Negro Leagues and look at the statistics of Amani Irvin and just see how special he was. And those, those records, you know, uh, uh, without the Hall of Fame, without BaseballReference.com, you don't have uh, a lot of information about Amani Irvin and how great he was. And he was the first uh, illustration that John Panisi did um, because I wanted to, I wanted my chapter on Monty Irvin to be the one that went out in the book proposals because I wanted people to read something that perhaps they had never read before. And it turned out to be the right decision because I can't tell you how many people have written me and told me just how amazing, uh, the story of Monty, not my, not my writer. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an okay writer, but the, just the amazing story that Monty Irvin, um, you know, that, that his journey, uh, and, and really it's one of the great regrets of my life, uh, my professional career, is that I never got the opportunity. I had the opportunity to interview him a couple of times and things fell through, and I never got the opportunity to talk to him face-to-face, -face, and I'll always regret that. I was going to ask you about that because you sent me a note that you had a chance to interview him. It did not occur. What exactly happened? What prevented it from taking place? Oh, it was a number of things, you know, um, it was just a timing thing, family stuff. It was just uh, just one of those things that, you know, I had an opportunity to call him on the phone and set up a meeting and, and it just never happened. And Marty Appel was very kind to, to try to organize it. And then Billy Staples, who I also mentioned in the book, another author, another great, great individual that's helped me over the years. It just, whatever, you know, it, just one of those things, Bruce, you know, I wish I remembered that so I could tell, oh yeah, I broke my leg and I couldn't interview him because then it would at least, you feel like you had a, a decent excuse, but that's why it's a regret that it just didn't happen. I mean, if I had known I was going to write a book 15 years later, maybe I would have, yeah. but um, you know, it just never happened. And, and, that, and I felt it was important to mention that in the book. You know, Monty Irvin was such a well-respected figure that Bowie Kuhn, when he became commissioner, uh, brought Monty Irvin to work for him in the commissioner's office. Yes. Uh, he really became a trusted advisor. He served in that role, I want to say, maybe for the balance of Kuhn's commissionership. Uh, but he was somebody that was there for a very long time in that role, uh, often came back here to Cooperstown, uh, of course, has since passed away. Uh, but one of those great players who was phenomenal, both in the Negro Leagues, but also in the major leagues. Also, he was somebody who was influential on this man, Willie Mays. Yes. Uh, we had a program recently with a terrific author, John Shea, who has yeah. uh, written a book about Willie Mays, knows him quite well. Uh, we did that on the occasion of Willie's 90th birthday this past spring. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Say Hey Kid. Obviously, he's going to be featured in the book. But do you have a favorite Mays story to pass along? Well, you know, my dad, uh, my dad, Ron, who, uh, by, by the way, is a dead ringer for Terry Collins. Uh, really, I mean, just unbelievable. People stop him in the street and always ask him to sign autographs. Really? Which he won't do, by the way. He won't do that. He says, I'm not Terry. You know, then he finally has to tell them he's not Terry. But um, my dad grew up... Uh, you know, an orphan. And, uh, you know, his great love was the Brooklyn Dodgers. He lived a couple of blocks away from Ebbets Field and whenever he could get, you know, the opportunity to go to the game or sneak in, 
you know, he, Duke Snyder was his guy. That was his player. That was his favorite player. Uh, but he has this great story about, it's 1951. And he's, he used to go outside the ballpark and they would all wait for the players to come out and get autographs. They had their little notebooks. I mean, my dad had nothing. I mean, this was, this was his life, you know, baseball and getting autographs from the guys. He had no idea who Willie Mays was. Uh, he just saw, he said, uh, you know, you, and I, I, I tell the story in the book that, you know, he saw this good looking guy, uh, young guy uh, come out. And he goes, oh, that, that guy's got to be a ball player. Uh, and he was wearing a band on shirt. My father was very specific. Make sure that you tell the people when you're writing the book that it was a band on shirt. <laughs> okay, dad. I included it because he's my dad and I listen. Yeah. But um, it turned out it was Willie Mays. Uh, that was his first ever, you know, it was like his first big autograph. And he didn't even realize who it was. He was just so happy. And he said the kid that, that, that Willie was so nice to him and nice to his friends. And that stuck with him. And then when he started to watch Willie Mays play, this uh, Duke Snyder is his favorite player. And he still says that Willie Mays uh, was the best player he ever saw play. And not that I needed my dad to tell me that. Um, but his opinion about baseball has always resonated with me mm -hmm. and he won the voting, uh, pretty easily. Uh, and I was surprised how easily he did win because Mickey Mantle is a fantastic player as well. Uh, but as I mentioned in the book, even Mickey Mantle thought, uh, Willie Mays, uh, was the best player he ever saw. So, um, you know, Willie Mays, you know, and, and, and I tried to go into his, uh, Mets career, which is often maligned, and I think that he played a bigger role uh, as as a as a legend in that clubhouse than most people give him credit for. And you know, to me, Willie Mays is just we're, we were lucky to have him in New York for the for the short time that we did. But when you're the greatest player, or at least to the opinion of most people, the greatest all around player that ever played the game, you know, he's got to be in the book. And and like I said, my dad. You know, my dad's opinion played a big role uh, in, in how I wrote about Willie Mays. Now, you said you're 53, Mark. You probably didn't see Willie play for the Mets, did you? At the time? I, you know, I, I don't remember. And I think I wrote about this in the book. I don't remember if the glimpses of of the 73 series were glimpses or highlights that I watched as a young, as a young boy, maybe in 75, because 75 is really my first vivid memory of baseball, you know, the 75 series and Joe yeah. Morgan, who was a big favorite of mine um, and watching that series. I didn't mention Carlton Fisk because I'm still mad that, that, that Gary Carter had to wait eight years to get in and, and Fisk was a first ballot Hall of Famer. But um, I, 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 I remember the old Rheingold commercials. Uh, with Willie Mays flexing his muscles. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've watched so much Willie Mays tape over the years. I guess I feel like I watched him play, but, um, you know, I, I probably, my memories are probably just glimpses of things that I watched when I was a kid rather than remembering the 73 series. You know, Willie was still a pretty good hitter when he was with the Mets. He wasn't an everyday player anymore. And he had some problems defensively, played some first base, uh, played a little right. bit in the outfield as well. But if you look at his offensive numbers in 72 and 73 with the Mets, he was still a, a good contributing player. And I think basically retired because he wasn't able to, to run and play defense the way that he once did. Uh, but certainly in his prime with the New York and San Francisco Giants, just about the perfect ball player. When yep. you talk about Willie Mays. Let's go from the outfield to behind the plate, Mike Piazza. Uh, he was actually not even on your ballot for the no. fans and the writers to consider. Uh, he made it as a write-in candidate. Great hitter, but an underrated catcher in your mind. Look, this is, uh, this is probably the most controversial pick uh, that I've heard from folks about uh, was Mike Piazza. And I, I think I make a, a, a darn good case for Mike uh, in the book. And I think that uh, especially the older fans that remember Roy Campanella and, 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 and certainly Yogi Berra, I thought, and I, I, write, I write this in the book, Bruce, I, I thought Yogi would win the vote 
hands down, because not only is he beloved by the Yankee fans, but the Met fan loves him too. The Met fan remembers the, 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 the guy that won a pennant in 73. They remember the beloved coach. Uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, I didn't really ever think of Yogi as a, as a Yankee because I was a kid and he was a coach for the Mets. So, you know, for me, I was like, how is Yogi Berra not going to get voted the best catcher of all time? And, and when you think about Gotham baseball and the, the fact that he was a Met and a Yankee and some of his greatest moments came against the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants, thematically, it would have worked great. Um, and also, uh, you know, Campanella, certainly with three MVPs, just like Yogi, certainly would have been a great pick. Uh, may have spent the best years of his life playing in the Negro Leagues, and, and he had some great years uh, with Brooklyn. But again, you know, catastrophic injury, tragic injury, ends his career before the team goes to Los Angeles. He probably still could have been a productive player. Um, but at the end of the day, Mike Baccaro from the New York Post, who's a, a, not only just a, a fantastic columnist and a, and a friend, but when I interviewed him for the book, I didn't know what he was going to say. Like, I was like, you know, isn't Barra the guy? I mean, how am I going to write a chapter about Mike Piazza? And this was before I really looked into the, all the different um, defensive metrics and things like that. But Mike basically said that Mike Piazza is not just the best hitting catcher of all time. He might be one of the top three right-handed hitters of all time. So there's no question that he is in the conversation. And the other part of it is, Bruce, is that I did not put Mike on the ballot. And I explain that in the book. I explain the, the relationship that my family has had with, had with Gary Carter, the relationship that I had with Gary Carter, what he meant to me as a player. And I felt that, you know, I wanted to put Gary on the ballot. And there was a couple of other people that I did that with that, you know, on the ballot. And if you read the book, you'll, you'll see but Gary meant so much to me. And I said, you know what? I didn't think Gary would win. I thought that Barry was going to win, as I said, but I wanted to have an opportunity that if he didn't get voted in, that I could write about Gary and what he meant to me, what he meant to my family. So, um, you know, then the ballot comes back. I get a couple of people who actually wrote letters to me uh, saying that Mike Piazza being on the ballot, not Gary is disgrace and how can you put a ballot out like this and you know I didn't I, I just said look I mean you know Mike's a great player you know the best hitting catcher of all time but you know Bear is going to win this thing anyway so I you know I, I didn't want to like you know I didn't want to make it a federal case and then Mike won the write-in ballot by such a convincing margin it wasn't even close how many people wrote in Mike Piazza. And this was not like a Met fan, you know, a Met fan, you know, result. This was sent to everybody. Uh, Mets fans, Yankee fans, you know, Red Sox fans, people from all over. So uh, the fact that Mike was, I, I was like, how could I, how could I not listen to the fans? How could I not listen to the people that voted in this ballot? It was like thousands and thousands of people voted in this thing. So then I started looking into, and I had interviewed Mike a bunch of times. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a question of, you know, not knowing Mike, not covering Mike. I mean, I knew the kind of player he was. I knew he wasn't a great thrower of the ball to get guys out, but I knew he did everything else well. But then I really delved into the numbers and I delved into, you know, talking to a bunch of experts. And they all agree that, you know, if Mike Piazza played today, outside of the throwing, he would be considered you know, one of the top three defensive catchers in all of baseball because he did everything else, especially framing, which is a huge deal now. Uh, you know, and there's some quotes from some of the pitchers that uh, he worked with over the years uh, who just go on and on about Mike's ability to receive behind the plate, block the ball, call a game. Um, and, you know, of course, his offensive prowess uh, is, is a matter of public record. So, um, I, I don't mind defending uh, the selection of Mike Piazza. It's just uh, it's illuminating uh, for some when they when they actually look at the numbers. Let's move 60 feet, six inches to the pitcher's mound. You've got several selections. We're going to begin with Tom Terrific. You admit he was your favorite player of all time. Absolutely. You remember, Mark, the first time you saw him pitch? 
You know, um, the first time I saw Tom Seaver pitch was my dad used to uh, be part of the Zavarian High School Father-Son Sports Night. Hmm. And the first time I used to go, the first time I went, I must have been, I had to have been about eight years old. And they would set up this big screen in the gym and they would show the 1969 World Series film. So that was the first time that I saw Tom Seaver pitch was on a big screen in a gym with a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of sports fans. Um, I, I wish I could tell you the first game I saw him pitch. I, my dad took me to so many games. Um, it, it's probably... Uh, was probably in 1976 when I saw him pitch. I don't know the date. I always, I always, I always get a kick out of people that remember the time they went to their first game and saw so and so pitch. I, I'm so jealous of that because I don't remember the date. I don't remember the game. Uh, I know it was a day game. I know he was on the mound. I know he won. Uh, I think I'm almost positive in '76 that it was. Uh, it might have been. Dave Kingman hit a home run to win the game. I've never really gone back and tried to figure it out. I don't know why, um, but I just love Tom. I, I, Tom Seaver, to me, is the perfect pitcher I've ever seen, like the most perfect pitcher. And I don't, I don't, I don't say that lightly. I just think that his motion, the, the drop and drive delivery, uh, the fact that he was always around the plate, the fact that he was laser focused, the fact that he was all about winning, the fact that, you know, all the stuff that I've read about Tom, that he was just always so spot on and ready to tell you the truth whenever it needed to be told. And so, as I said, Tom, Tom Seaver was always my favorite pitcher, but, and always my favorite player, but doing this chapter on him, if it was possible, I have so much more respect for Tom as a baseball player than I ever have. And as a man, as I, as I ever have in my life. So to me, it was a privilege to write that chapter about Tom Seaver because in doing all the research that I did, and I think I probably wrote more about Tom than anybody else in the book. And, and, and I'm sorry, but you know, I just, I found so much stuff uh, just digging into the archives and, 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 and looking things up and trying to, get a sense because I knew he wasn't going to be with us very long. And when I got the word that he had passed away, really, it was like, I usually don't get affected by the death of people I don't know personally. And just because I interviewed Tom a couple of times, doesn't mean I, I knew him personally. Yeah. Um, or at least he's not a friend. I wouldn't consider him a friend, but when he, it was a gut punch because I, I realized that I know he was sick. I, I figured that out at the beginning of the process of writing the book that I wasn't going to be able to interview him one more time. It, it's like you lost something. It's, it's the passing of your youth, the passing of, I'll never talk to this guy, you know, and it was, I'm usually not affected by that. You know, I'm kind of a curmudgeon that way, but it really like, I'm so glad I did the work that I did on the chapter and, and writing about Tom and learning about Tom. Um, because I would have felt, you know, that I didn't do a good job if I hadn't done that. So I'm proud of the chapter. Um, and, and Tom was just to me, the, if, if you're going to build a picture in, in a, in a, in a, in a lab, that's the guy that you do it, you know? And he was always, even in that picture. I mean, look at him. I mean, he's a cherub, you know, I mean, always youthful. I always thought he was the most youthful guy in his face and the way he carried himself, even though he had a sharp tongue and even though he could be tough, you know, to me, he was just, my God, when you're going to, you know, how could you get better than Tom Seaver? You just can't. So yeah, he was my guy. I've never heard anyone speak more intelligently about the art of pitching than Tom Seaver. I had a chance to interview him four times in three days here at the hall of fame back in the early two thousands. And it's still one of the highlights of my career. I could listen to him talk about pitching and Gil Hodges and those Mets days. Uh, yeah. and he was he was fantastic. Uh, another picture you included in the book, the chairman of the board, Whitey Ford. 
I think somewhat underrated in that, you know, he didn't do it with power pitching. Only once did he ever strike out over 200 hitters. Uh, did it more with finesse and with smarts, but absolutely at the top of the, the pitching chart. One of the really interesting things that I, I came across with Whitey Ford is the fact that um, Casey Stengel babied him. His, his, the, the entire time that Casey was the manager of the Yankees, he would not let Whitey pitch as much as any of his other pitchers. And, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Casey felt because he was smaller and he was a lefty and he wasn't a power pitcher and he couldn't handle the load. But the minute Ralph Houck became the manager of the Yankees, uh, he's, he told Whitey, look, I'm throwing you out there. and You're going to throw 200 innings and you're going to pitch every fourth day. And it really changed Whitey's career. You know, it changed, you know, he became a much better pitcher with, with more work. And had Whitey been able to do that, he would have been a 300 game winner. Uh, the Yankees probably don't lose the 1960 World Series if he pitches all three games. And Mickey Mantle always said it was the one thing that just stuck in his craw, his, you know, for his career that they lost that series to those Pirates in 1960. Yeah, sure, it's a great story for the Pirates. It's a great, great moment for Bill Mazarowski. But think about if Twitter was around if social media was around, if the media, the way it is now was around that, that, you know, I mean, yeah, it did eventually cost Casey his job, but just think about just leading up to it. How, you're not going to pitch Whitey all three games, you know, in three games. I and mean, that's what aces did back then. They pitched three games. Sometimes they won and they became the world series MVP. Um, Whitey to me, uh, just a consummate New York guy, you know, Queens. I mean, everybody that ever known Whitey just had nothing but great things to say about him. And I know had I been around, I would have loved him. I mean, obviously I probably, you know, me and my dad fight about this all the time. I don't know if I would have been a Dodger fan or a Brooklyn, a Brooklyn Dodger fan being a Brooklyn kid growing up in Flatbush, or I would have been a New York giant fan because I loved DeRocher. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, man. You know, I, I might have been a Yankee fan, you know, because they had a lot of guys. Uh, Whitey probably would have been the guy that brought me over because he was, a, you know, a story of kid. You know, he was, he, you know, he was a guy that and I, I, I wore glasses when I was a kid. I got picked on a lot. And, and you know, Whitey just seemed the kind of guy that you would move for. You know, the guy that uh, a bully probably would try to take on because he was a little guy. Um, Whitey Ford is just, you know. Um, a funny little story. Uh, I know I'm going on and on and on, but a funny little story that that painting, uh, the picture was from Billy Menzel from an old timers game, but the, uh, the illustration of Whitey, um, John Panisi, who's the artist for Gotham baseball. He, uh, is very good friends with the old Yankees. Uh, he was very good friends with Phil Rizzuto and through that relationship, uh, became very good friends with Yogi Berra and very good friends with Whitey Ford. So when Whitey was still with us, John had sent the portrait to the Fords because, you know, he just wanted them to see. He was proud of what he had done and he wanted to share it with them. And, you know, his, his wife called up John and said, John, this is so beautiful. You captured Whitey so well. But I don't remember when he played for the Gotham baseball team. <laughs> So, I mean, I just thought that was a great story and uh, kind of just captures the kind of sweetness that that Mrs. Ford uh, is and, you know, just really captured the kind of guy. I, I hope my chapter captured the kind of picture that Whitey was. Mark, we're running short on time, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I want to talk just a moment about Joan Payson, uh, somewhat forgotten in terms of maybe younger fans not realizing what a great owner she was. She was the first owner of the Mets, bought the team, uh, owned the team in 62, uh, was the owner in 69 when they won the team. Uh, but this is somebody that was popular with the fans, with the media, with the players, really did a terrific job leading the Mets franchise in those early years. Yeah, for me, um, when I went into the owner portion of the, of the book, you know, I, I made it very clear that early, early in the Gotham baseball, really the first person to really uh, recognize Gotham baseball was George Steinbrenner. 
um, and wrote me more than one letter uh, and was always a source of strength in, in challenging times. Uh, it would have been very easy for me to, to call George Steinbrenner the best owner uh, of all time, but um, as it would have been with Jacob Rupert, who did everything he could to win. Um, certainly, uh, you know, Charles Ebbets did a fantastic job building Ebbets Field and creating a, a Brooklyn Dodger team that everyone remembers. Uh, but for me, it was Joan Payson. Um, she, she, if it wasn't for Joan Payson, who knows if the Mets would even, even have existed. She was someone who loved baseball so much. She tried to buy the New York Giants from Horace Stoneham when he wanted to move the team uh, first to Minneapolis and then to San Francisco. She had the money to do it. She had the will to do it. And, and really, maybe in a different time, she would have been able to do it. You know, she would have been able to, you know, become the first person, first woman to buy a baseball team. And she wound up having to wait a few years, but she finally got it done. The, the, the opportunity was there. Think about it. This is 19, you know, 61, 1960. And a woman buys a baseball team and someone who actually cared about the game, someone who was a fan from when she was a kid. And, and I, you know, I so struck by all the, when I did the research and I started thinking about, you know, who I was going to pick. And to me is a no brainer. Not only did she buy the team in 1962. Okay. She almost hired Branch Rickey to be the first general manager of the Mets. I mean, that would have been quite a story. Yeah. But as, as I write in the book, you know, Branch Rickey wanted a piece of every player he ever like acquired or treated. So uh, the amount of money that was being discussed, Joan Payson was like, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so she went and she got George Weiss, uh, you know, and George Weiss, you know, he, he doesn't, he's not remembered as the architect of the great, of, of, of the 1969 Mets, but he probably should be because it wasn't for him. The Mets would not have, uh, you know, again, you know, Bing Devine had a call, had a talk, came into it. But if it wasn't for George Weiss, the Mets would have never put up the money to be in the, in the you know, pass the hat to try to get Tom Seaver. Uh, so, you know, he was very, very uh, instrumental in the building the foundation of the team. And Joan Payson was the one who hired him. Joan Payson was the one who called Casey Stengel on the phone and, and, and got Casey to agree to come and manage the Mets. Uh, she was somebody that was the number one fan of the team. She sat in her box and she talked to the fans. And she, I mean, you don't find many owners like that today. She lived and died with every loss. When she was traveling the country, she always had a transistor radio so she could hear the games or she had people send her telegrams to know what was going on. Um, and let's be honest, folks, before the Marlins did it, the Mets were the first expansion team to win that World Series, and they did it in, what, eight years, seven years? It was just amazing what she was able to do uh, as a woman in the game at that time. And for me, if it wasn't for Joan Payson, I wouldn't have a baseball team to root for. Mm -hmm. And I just think that when you talk about owners and you talk about what you want them to be, I've always been the, the kind of person that want my owners to love my team, to make sure that we have the resources, to make sure that we can contend and just sign the checks and get out of the way. And that's what Joan Payson did. And that's why she was, in my, in my opinion, the greatest owner uh, in New York baseball history. The book is Gotham Baseball. Here are a couple ways you can buy it. Go to Mark's site, gothambaseball.com slash purchase, or you can go to arcadiapublishing.com. There's some other ways as well. But if you go to Mark's site at Gotham Baseball, you'll see all the different uh, ways that you can purchase uh, this book from Mark Keeley. Mark, we do really appreciate your time. Some great insights into the Mets and the Yankees, the Giants, the Brooklyn Dodgers, these many great players, uh, managers and owners in the history, proud history of New York City baseball. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce, and everybody involved with the Hall of Fame. This was a great thrill and a great honor to be part of it today. We thank Mark and also, of course, the generous support of the Ford Motor Company for making these programs possible. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching over this past hour. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.